Well, welcome to uh, Emerald Hill Skies. We do live uh, views through uh, our Rasa 11 inch, and we're here on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky. Everything has just come together beautifully tonight, and so we are really happy to have you here. Uh, if you like this kind of content, I hope you'll subscribe and hit that uh, bell so you'll be notified when we do new videos like this, new live streams. Uh, if you would also be willing to share the channel, that might be a way that you could perhaps give back to other folks. And uh, it helps the channel to be able to get out to others so that they can find out about us too. And, uh, you know, that would be awesome if, if you were willing to do that. We are um, looking forward to getting going here tonight. Let's begin by trying to um, make sure that our telescope is focused. And to do that, we're going to call up Nina, and uh, Nina stands for Nighttime Imaging and Astronomy. Uh, we're going to turn on the camera, which is a Z ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro, and we're going to turn on the focus motor, which is a Celestron uh, focus motor. Frank, you're already there. Hello, hello, hello from Schenectady, New York. Welcome. <laughs> you're, uh, you're amazing. Brother, you are just such an encouragement. Um, let's see, then we're gonna go to imaging and we're gonna start the autofocus routine. Now this Nina is really, to me, a great tool. And I know for you guys that are already into astronomy, uh, you already know all about this. So uh, I, I don't need to tell you, but for those who are maybe watching this video and seeing uh, electronically assisted astronomy or EAA for the first time. I got to tell you that when I began working on uh, uh, astronomy, I was having a hard time figuring out when things were in focus. And I tried this thing called a Batonoff mask, for example. It's got this unique cutout pattern on a little screen you put over the top of the obje objective opening of your, your telescope. And that causes this weird set of spikes to occur and you line up this one uh, center spike with this X, and I know it sounds bizarre, but you know, some people who have really good eyesight might be able to do that. My telescope, our telescope here, Emerald Hill Skies, it is a very, uh, what you might call in photography terms, a fast scope. And what comes along with a fast scope, it's a focal ratio of F2, is a very narrow, uh, depth of field, they call it in photography. In astronomy terms, it's usually called a critical focus zone, or CFZ. The critical focus zone for this telescope is measured in microns, it's so small, and I could never get pinpoint stars, I could never get the focus exactly right. And that's when I came across this tool, Nina. And it's really designed, I think, for astrophotographers more than anything else. But uh, a very smart guy, whom I respect a lot, helped uh, some others write a, a plug-in for Nina that takes care of auto-focusing the scope for us. And if this is the first time you've seen this work, you're probably watching the screen saying, what is happening? But it's actually a somewhat of a, of a reasonable thing, I think, once you understand. The telescope and the camera are aimed up at the stars and they snap a picture or two and they calculate, the telescope and the camera work together with the computer here to calculate the, the half flux radius of the stars that they see. And we have it set to do multiple stars. So you're not just focusing on one star like you do with a Batonoff mask, you're focusing on an entire field of stars. And calculating what you might, I mean, in my terms, in terms of my intellect understanding it, it basically calculates the luminance of the stars that are there. Not exactly how bright they are, but you could sort of understand it that way. And just think of it, the, the more out of focus your stars are, what does that mean? Well, it means they're getting fuzzier. And if they're fuzzier, the light is spreading out. And on the kind of telescope we have, the light finally makes each star look like a little miniature Cheerio. It really looks like a donut, you know. The wider those stars get, the, the bigger the luminance is because the, the flux, 
is getting wider, and that means the radius is wider, measuring from the center of that donut out to the edge. Well, that half flux radius, it keeps getting bigger and bigger, the less uh, focused the telescope is. So what we're doing here is using this focus motor being robotically controlled by the software, the telescope is actually moving the focus motor uh, with the mirror moving in one direction, like let's say in at first, and it measures until it finally says, scratches its head and says, oh my goodness, this is getting worse and worse. And that's the, the graph you see here that, that's graphing up high. It means that the radius, the half flux radius was getting bigger and bigger. Finally, the telescope concludes, oh my goodness, we are way out of focus. So it goes back to the beginning of when it found the best, that is the smallest pinpoint star. And finally, it, um, it starts going the other side of that pinpoint. And hello, Papa Tech. I think if I remember right, you're from down somewhere in Florida. You rubbed it in, you rubbed it in the other night when I had seven degrees, you had like 51 or 52. And you were imaging, uh, I think you were imaging some nebula. I think maybe it was the Rosette Nebula or something like that. Uh, it, it, it then moves to the other side of what it found to be the smallest half flux radius previously. And if it's correct at finding the smallest half flux radius, then the stars finally get bigger now with the mirror moving the other direction. Like if it was moving closer to the opening the first time, now it's moving away from the opening. Uh, now you can see the stars are starting to become more donut-like in the other direction. And it'll check three or four other positions just to make sure that uh, we're, we're accurate, you know. And then it calculates mathematically, electronically, it calculates a beautiful hyperbola. And it, it averages out the upsides and downsides of these focal points. Rosette, correct. Oh, clouds. Well, at least you've got, I bet, better temperatures. I think here we have something like 20 degrees. Uh, as, as it moves the other direction now, the stars are getting bigger, and it's going to calculate the hyperbole. And notice it compensates for maybe fluctuations in the atmosphere. And that's why you see that sometimes uh, our graph is just microns off from where it was before. And this is being measured very precisely. Uh, as it calculates the average of these different seeing points, it's going to calculate this hyperbole, <clears throat> this hyperbola, and then it's going to find the closest point uh, that it can guess is the best focus of all. And it's really accurate for me. Uh, so this is a calibrated focus. It's a mathematical focus, and it's already done, as you can see. So it's found our focus to be 30,197. That's the number of the stop. Um, and you can see the, <clears throat> the focus motor has like 40,000 different stops. And uh, that's very, very exact focus. So we're done. We're focused. So what we'll do now is we'll go back up to the equipment here. And we'll disconnect the focus motor. And hello, Kim from Australia. Nice to have you on. Frank, have you ever seen if Nina's focusing routine is close in any way to the multi-star full width half maximum, the FWHM focus assist assistant in SharpCap? You know, the last time I tried SharpCap, at least when I tried it last, it wasn't automatic. And I get such a kick out of this being uh, automatic that I just kind of let it roll. And I, I love that. Okay, so we're disconnected. We're going to close Nina. And now let's open up uh, our utility that we can just now start tonight using correctly. And that is the Pegasus Astro, um, not that one, the Pocket Power Box. Let's put that one back over there out of the way. That I don't know what that is, the Unity platform. I don't know what that is. We're going to open up the Pegasus Astro Pocket Power Box um, control panel. You can see it's already connected, and it's telling us that our voltage is fluctuating between 12.8 and 13.9. And uh, that's to be expected because when the dew strips pop on and pop off, 
it takes a little more of the voltage and the voltage suffers a little bit of a hit. Notice we can measure the exact current and amps that are flowing through and we, we probably want that to stay under 10 and we're at 1.5. So we're, we're great on our amperage. It's calculating the outside temperature down to the 10th of a degree. So it's 22.1 degrees to be exact. Uh, Papa Tech, and can you give us a temperature readout for where you are in Florida when you get a chance, Papa Tech? You got the ZWO EAF, the, um, the ZWO version of autofocus for Christmas, and I, I bet it does work like magic. 73 um, relative humidity, 73%, and it's calculated the dew point at 14.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So I love this because now all of the dew uh, control is being uh, calculated uh, by computer and controlled in a computer way. Not only the dew strip for the RASA 11 inch main scope that we have, but also for the um, the secondary camera we have, uh, a ZWO 178, an ASI 178 mono. We'll show you in a second. So I love this new pocket power box control panel and it feels like we're getting a lot better analysis of all of our electricity. Uh, Kim's rubbing it in that he has blue skies, sunny, and 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, let's just pause for a moment and think about the fact that Kim is down there sweating in Australia. Oh my goodness. Uh, Papa Tech in Florida says a 61. Did you really want to know? Laugh out loud. Now that you mention it, I'm not sure that we did. No, I'm just kidding. I think that's great. You you have, I'm sure, let's see, USB control hub is the next thing we want to pull up. This lets us control every single USB uh, uh, port on the new six port USB control hub individually. We can turn them on and turn off. For instance, we don't have anything in port five. So let's deactivate that. We don't have anything in port six. Now I think if I remember right, we don't have anything in port four, but I'm gonna leave that on just because I don't wanna mess anything up. <laughs> um, this is great because what this means is everything is working exactly the way we wish it would. The telescope started up so quickly, the mount started so quickly, everything worked perfectly. And I'll tell you the secret. The secret is don't flow any auxiliary power through the mount that we use. And the kind of mount we use is from a company called Ioptron, and it's the CEM70G, which is made to be able to run your USB signals through the mount. Well, for me, it just doesn't work. That's what I've uh, you know, concluded. Tonight, I'm not even running any auxiliary power uh, through the mount to the front of the saddle so that you could plug things into that saddle power because that doesn't work. When that's working, uh, it throws the camera out of whack. It throws the USB 3 signal out of whack. I don't know if the wires are too close to each other and they interfere with each other or what. All I can tell you is after a lot of testing, it doesn't work. So if you've got a CEM 70G and if it's the same generation as mine and you've been having trouble with your USB 3 signal, I highly recommend uh, don't even use it for power. And that's why we've got this Pegasus Astro Pocket Power Box Micro now. We're just not even using the mount for power at all. Uh, we're, we're, we're powering the mount in, in its own power so that it can run its uh, you know stepper motors, but we're not using the flow through power that you can sort of add to the mount and plug in your own voltage. We're not using that auxiliary power at all. Uh, and what that's allowing us to do is operate here with no dropouts and we, we are loving that. Okay, so the next thing we want to open up, uh, let's see if we can get a window of sharp cap open to just look at the sky. So this is going to be our connection with the sky. Keep in mind there's about 200 feet between us and our telescope out there in the, in the field, uh, the meadow outside of this building, the, the prayer and atrium. Uh, the prayer center and atrium here at Emerald Hills on the outskirts of Louisville. About 200 feet out there is the scope in a meadow, and uh, you're seeing live views of the scope. This is not a picture. That's an actual video of the scope, and we have it there on a little tiny tripod, and we have it basically sighting down the 
like as if it's a rifle sight, looking down the rifle sight toward the Polaris, the North Star. With this little view of sharp cap, we're going to bring up our, our uh, sky view camera. It's the ASI 178. We're going to try two seconds, and we'll just leave it at maybe, I don't know, 300 gain, <clears throat> you think? That's a lot of Louisville skylight, but look how it's letting us see the stars. Let's try 250 gain. That's a little bit darker, but I tell you what, let's split the difference. Let's go with 275. So this is shooting a picture of the sky every two seconds, and that great big bright light you see up there on the left, that's the moon. Uh, so it is uh, giving us some, some, uh, some moonlight tonight, but it shouldn't get in our way too much. Down here at the bottom of this view, you might be able to barely see the um, what you might call the dew shield, the dew shield at the front of the scope. And that just kind of keeps us oriented to, to the fact that you're looking like a rifle sight in the same direction as the scope. So here is the Big Dipper, if you can see those stars in your view. <clears throat> Let me brighten that up a little bit for you, just in case you're having trouble seeing that. There you go. There's the Big Dipper. Um, and notice how you can use these pointer stars to look at the North Star. So there's Polaris. And right now our scope is looking directly at Polaris. Our ASI 178's mounted just barely a little bit to the left of center of the scope. This is Cassiopeia over here, that W shape or M. You could think of it as an M. It's always on the opposite side of the Big Dipper. So I love this. Uh, this uh, 178 mono because this will keep us connected with the sky. We can kind of see the big picture of whatever the sky is showing us. So let's make that as big as we can. And I don't think we're going to have to uh, bother much with the controls anymore. So let's just get them out of our way. And uh, this is just our big picture of the sky here. Since we're not outdoors in the 22 degrees cold, Whenever we want, we can toggle over here and see the sky. Now let's open up another um, instance of sharp cap. And with this instance of sharp cap, let's see if we can get now our uh, ASI 2600 MC Pro, which is the camera that's actually hooked to the telescope. And that uh, sky view camera that we're using here that's not even going through a telescope. That's just the raw camera, and it has what's called a um, sky view type lens in it that gives a big broad picture. I forget, it's like 150 degrees of the sky, pretty much like the human eye sees. So it gives us that connection to the sky. You can see it's picking up uh, really well on a light that the neighbor has. Now, in reality, that light's not that bright, but we have everything exaggerated here so you can see these star points a little better on YouTube, but that light's not that bright in reality. Now let's go over here and you can see we've got the ASI 2600 up. It's running well. This is four seconds at 400 gain, and we'll just leave it at that for a second. Now let's bring up our, uh, by the way, that does look like good focus. Uh, now let's bring up Starry Night Pro. And Starry Night Pro is our planetarium software. And it's pretty much just what you'd see if you went out to a planetarium and you know how you sit in one of those domed uh, those domed planetariums and they let you lean way back in the chairs, you know, and you look up in the top of the dome and they project the sky to you. Well, that's pretty much what this is. This is a projection of the sky. And we have a favorite folder here we're going to open up. There's Curtis. Welcome, Curtis. Oh my goodness, Curtis, the mount is operating like a dream. Once we stopped running the user auxiliary power through it, like you're supposed to be able to do to get power out the front of the saddle, once we stop doing that, the mount loves us. So this is a very happy night. This is the first time in history that we've been able to actually use this mount like it's intended to be used. So now we're looking at the Starry Night Pro, and you know if you've at all been talking to me lately, uh, you know that I've fallen in love again with Starry Night Pro. It's like rediscovering Starry Night Pro. And right now it's uh, showing you a picture of the Rasa 11 field of view, that tiny rectangle there. But we're not connected to this telescope yet. So 
let's uh, let's go up here to show telescope setup and let's connect to the scope unpark failed okay so we had not started the tracking yet for the scopes what that's telling us let's go here and let's say tracking enabled boy look at that you know what i might take back all the bad stuff i've been saying about asi commander this is the little software that runs the mount and uh, i've i'm not a cussing man i i don't i just don't use cuss words but if I ever were to start using cuss words, it would have been about ISI Commander, or Ioptron Commander, ISI. It would have been about Ioptron Commander if I were to ever cuss, but I've, I'm not. I just want you to know I'm not. Now, let's cancel out of this, and I I hope, let's try this again now. Um, view your telescope setup. Uh, why don't we hit configure just to make sure, yeah, that's the proper, scope so let's go back to that again and let's hit connect yes so now we're connected with uh starry night pro and i love this little button here align on gaze i know it has its ups and downs but i love it because whatever the telescope is looking at that's what our planetarium Okay, that's okay. We we won't do that yet. Um, let's go here and go to, um, you know what? I don't think it is a line on gaze. It's called follow scope. That's what I meant to do. Follow scope. Now we'll get rid of that little panel. And notice it put a little title here. And that's the name of our mount. And look how, let me zoom in on this a little bit. So you can see, look how it is now pointing right at Polaris. And this red rectangle you see is the approximate field of view of our telescope. So they're, they're completely aligned. Now, I don't know if that's um, a perfect alignment for that rectangle. Let's go back over to SharpCap and just look for a second. Uh, we're on the widest view of our camera. I'm thinking this is Polaris here. So maybe it's almost easier to look in the other view, the sky view. Oh, but the camera might not be exactly aligned with the ASI uh, 2600. So let's don't worry about the alignment of that rectangle right now. Uh, I think that rectangle is a little bit skewed, and we can adjust that later if we have to. Uh, with that aligned now, I think we're ready to go look at our first target. And let's go to a list. And the list we were working on the other night was this January 7th list. And I think we got pretty far along. I tell you what, I'll tell you what let's do. Instead of doing that, let's just go... Just to get started, let's look at some of the Messier targets here. And we worked our way the other night up to about, what, 41 or something? I forget exactly where we left off. Um, let's just start to make sure. Let's take a look at M42. I'm going to show info here. And look, this is, this is our last observation on... January 4th, so that that was one that we did. Now let's look at M43 and show info there. Ah, so that's where we were. We were ready for M43. Now what I want to do up here first is go to Observe and start a new session. So this is a new session. This is the 41st, 44th time that we've done a uh, EAA, and tonight we're going to call it uh, Live Telescope Views, and the site is Emerald Hills, of course, and we're going to say 22 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Can you believe it? Everything 
is working perfectly. Wow, that's just too good to be true, isn't it? Okay, so we've started our session. Now let's go to M42. And what we want to do is slew there. Now I have no idea. Uh, but what happens is, let me, let me um, kind of back off here so you can see the, um, the telescope move. And then what we'll also do is bring up the actual live view of the scope so you can see the telescope moving. You know what, while, while that's getting settled, Oh, M42 is the Orion Nebula. <laughs> of course, we knew that. I just want to make for a second, I want to make this bigger for a moment. And I want to show you, this is the new little, uh, what would you call that? Like a sled or a equipment plate? Let's call it that. This is a new little equipment plate. And we have it uh, mounted there with one of those Los Mandi um, adapter plates for that dovetail on top of the Rasa. And then we have the equipment plate mounted at the top of that. And then on top of that, we have the uh, control hub, the Pegasus Astro USB control hub. And on top of that, we have the Pegasus Astro pocket power box micro. And then right here in front is the 178. And see the little do strap around it so that we try to minimize the do forming on the 178. This is the dew shield on the front of the Rasa telescope. And that dew shield is basically just a big piece of black tin with felt inside of it. And it blocks a little bit of the dew. And there's another dew strap right here that's black. And it is also trying to warm up the objective lens. And notice there's nothing plugged into the front of that saddle anymore because it did not work, you know. So notice the way this works, though. Now we have one single... A spiral bound cable made up of two cables, water falling off the back of the scope. One is our power cable to all that, all those accessories, and the other is the data, uh, USB 3, in other words, the data cable going to the, to the Pegasus Astro USB control hub, and that's all that's water falling off the back of the scope, but it did not work. So you can see right here on the back of the right ascension, right ascension plate, we have Nothing powering through that right ascension plate the way you're supposed to be able to do with a CEM70G. Nothing at all powering through that at all. So uh, that's what we've learned, guys. So if you've got a if you've got a CEM70G, boy, if your experience is anything like my experience, I would run, not walk, to get your stuff unplugged from that, so that um, you too can enjoy these. Um, Trouble-free connections. Okay, you know, the Orion Nebula is so beautiful. Uh, we're looking at it here in the in the planetarium software. And you can see roughly this is this is what we should be looking at. Up here at the top is NGC 1, uh, 1975, and there's 1977. We go all the way down and we see um, the M42 here, we see M43 here at the top, and then we we give way to NGC 1980, and those are clusters, the NGC 1975 and NGC 1977. Now, what we can do here is we can adjust our um, pointing just a little bit. I kind of think what we want to be looking at is maybe, does it let us... What is the, how do we slew to the middle of this? Now, if we say center, I don't think that works. Do we have to, I thought we could pick a place. Let's, let's just pick a star and let's slew to that and see if that raises a little bit. We need to raise a little bit so we can. about this? Let's slew to M43 and see if that raises us a little bit. Uh, 
Okay, it did. That that raised us. So now let's back off and see if that gives us. Yeah, look at that field. That's that's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, we're able to get. I think all of that nebula in now, all the way up to that top of NGC 1975. So now, with that having been set, let's go over to Sharp Cap, and we want the view of. Uh, first of all, let's look at the 178. Oh my goodness, look at what the moon is doing to us. That is just ruining us. Let's go with, um, let's leave this on two seconds, but just back off this gain. That moonlight is just deafening. If it were a sound, it would be, ah, oh, it would be so loud. Uh, but you can see Orion here in the middle of our field of view, and that's Orion's belt. Let's just zoom in here for a minute. And see Orion there, and there's Orion's belt, and we're going to look down here with our, with our telescope, here in Orion's sword, okay? Look at all that glare from the moon. Uh, so let's back this off so I won't forget get the big view of the sky and let's go back over now to um, this view of sharp cap and the first thing let's do is plate solve um, so what we're gonna try to do here is hmm. it's a little strange down there doesn't it Oh, it's because it's not connected. That's strange, isn't it? Oh, I remember why. Last week when the mount wouldn't work, I told SharpCap we didn't have a mount <laughs> in order that I could just make it see something. <laughs> so let's go here to the mount and let's... Choose that mount and connect it. There we go. And let's do our plate solving. Now, I know you guys are pros. We have about 17 folks watching. Um, Patrick, hello to you. I don't know who else is watching that hasn't checked in. We'd love to have you say where you're from if you'd like to. But we've got about 17 people watching. If you are not familiar with plate solving, what it just did is it snapped a picture of the sky. It compared the picture that it snapped with its encyclopedia of sky images. And it said, wait a second, you're not looking at exactly what you should be looking at. If you want to see the Orion Nebula, you got to look here. And it made a 1.66 degree correction. Now, why did it do that? It's because we don't do what's sometimes called star alignment with this telescope and with this software because you really don't have to. What we do is we polar align the tripod and we make sure that the mount is polar aligned. And then we put the telescope on there and then we connect it to this uh, software and this, this view of the sky and we let plate solving take care of aligning the mount precisely. So you don't have to do two star or three star alignment ever again if you can do this plate solving. So it really works well. Okay, now we want to set up our, our time. So let's go up to our sequencer and let's switch everything to starting to image. And what that does is it changes our, our time, our exposure to 20 seconds. It changes our gain to 100. It starts live stacking. It kind of begins the process for us for all these things that we want to do and just gets us going in kind of a an automated way. And bam, there's the first live stacked image of the uh, Great Nebula and Orion. So what we'll do now is we'll color balance this to get our white balance a little bit better. So we're using the reset button and then the auto color balance. And then we're just looking at it. And to me it looks like we have, there. by the way, there goes a satellite kind of um, kind of taking its own selfie of our view. Um, 
It looks like there are a lot of blues there, doesn't it? Looks like quite a bit of blues. However, some of this nebulosity is blue, but let's just back off the blue just a little bit. And I mentioned that the reason why that happens in part, look up here in image controls. I do have the blue turned up to 65 and the red turned up to 65. And that's to balance out the filter that we use. It's the Celestron um, light pollution filter. Rocky Cardwell, how are you, brother? All the way out there from Colorado. We are so glad you're here, Rocky. Uh, this is so nice of you to check in. And there's Brent in Alabama and Simon from Western Australia. So you're, oh boy, you're over in Perth. And we've got Kim on from Sydney. So you guys are probably, what, about 3,000 miles apart from each other there? We've got, let's see, I forget where some of the rest of you are. Um, of course, Frank is in Schenectady. Um, if you want to say where you're from, by all means, jump on. Let's see. Another thing we want to do is um, start working with the live stack here. We want to bring that until that sky is black. I'm going to bring down the blues one more increment. There we go. And we're really pushing as much as we probably want to push. Um, now that's with two minutes and 20 seconds. I just want to say I'm amazed at the Rasa, but I'm also amazed at EAA. Because first of all, look at what a bright moonlit night we have. What is the moon? Somebody tell us, what, what percentage are we? Um, I'm gonna look here in my, my weather app that we use for astronomy, 62% is what the moon is, 62%. Now that's a lot of moonlight. And look how in this image, it's like we don't even care. By the way, here is that satellite that photo bombed our picture right at the beginning. Um, we've got three minutes here and we can already see much of this luminosity uh, nebulosity that we were looking at in our planetarium program earlier. This is that cluster that's beginning to form here that was 1980, and it gives way to this cluster. Uh, what is that? 1979, is it? I'm sorry, it starts with 1975, and then it goes to 1977. Those sound like really good years, don't they? I think I graduated from high school in 1975. <laughs> I did. So this this cluster here is named after the year I graduated from high school. That's the way we'll remember that. And then 1977, one of us, I bet, on the on the live stream, I bet one of you all graduated in 1977. Look at all this beautiful powder puff luminosity, and it's all being powered by that cluster 1975 and 1977 behind it you see and this cloud is made up now that's the planetarium view but let's go back to the live view that's our 178 view uh, here's our live view through the telescope so this is no this is no longer planetarium that's a live view so this was 1975 cluster and it's lighting up all that nebulosity this is 1977 cluster. And look, here's a dark nebula here. So let's go find out what that dark nebula is. We're gonna, we're gonna enlarge it a little bit here. Look at that dark nebula. It's a bunch of dust and smoke in front of uh, this nebula that's being formed here by the cluster that's backlighting it. It's all hydrogen and oxygen. Let's go over to our planetarium program. And we, we can see that that's, um, this dark nebula is the Orion Dark Nebula Complex. This is what they call it. Uh, this entire dark nebula here. Let's do one other thing. Let's right click on that and say select other and see if it has an LDN number. It does. It is LDN 1641. So just for a minute, let's select LDN 1641. And with that selected now, I wonder, uh, 
Yeah, we are selected in LDN. Now, I wonder if I say new observation. Yeah, it is, it is doing an observation of the dark nebula complex. And we want to associate this with whatever the session was that we said we were doing. Was it 0043? Now, once we associate the first one, we won't have to set that anymore. It'll assume that every other thing that we're doing, and we'll do the same thing with our uh, 2600, and we're just going to say dark nebula, and it was called um, LDN 1641. LDN 1641 was dark and beautiful. Dark, let's make it poetic, deep and beautiful. Um, so this is a live observation now we did, and that'll forever be recorded. Uh, let's do quick observations of M42. So let's select M42. We could just do it over here, couldn't we? We could say new observation, and notice how it changes to M42 here. Notice how it kept our um, session name, and we're going to say, wow, in two minutes, this nebula was already amazing. Um, and also, we're seeing M43. Let's go back over to our live view of M43. Whoops, I missed it. Right there is where it is. And let's back off a little bit because M43 is so big, we can't even see all of it. Wow, look at that. Now, this is with seven minutes. And right there is where we want to save the picture. That's M43. Look at all those filaments, little, little uh, lanes of dust and hydrogen being lit up, all this red and pink. That's backlit hydrogen, ionizing right here in front of our eyes. Look at all this uh, greenish, bluish stuff. That's probably some oxygen and and uh, who knows what else. Is this Alnitak? Is that right? This star here? I, I lose track of that. that. That's called Alnitak, isn't it? Let's go back over here and let's... So we're going to minimize the window in front. And this star here. No, it's not Alnitak, is it? Looks like it's... Nair al Saif. Yeah, Nair al Saif. Uh, M43 is the nebula complex up here at the top, and M42 is the nebula complex here. So let's go back to Sharp Cap. See up here, this is M43. This little thing that looks, wow, that thing looks like a, um, how would you describe it? Just if you could. Type into, the, thank you, Kim, you were right. Only talk is near the flame nebula. Would you type into the chat screen, how would you describe, can you feel my little heater plugged in? I'm going to just, oh my goodness, I dropped the camera. Yikes. What have we got going on here? This is live TV, folks. Um, down there, I don't know if you can see it, but I've got a heater running because you know why? The heat is off in, in this wing of our building. And so, wouldn't you know it, I'm, I'm spoiled now that the temperature is down to 67 here. And I just thought, you know, my feet are a little bit cold. <laughs> so I brought a heater tonight so we could warm up and I've got it set on 70. So we get a little bit of toast. How would you describe M43? See this right here? You know, it looks like to me a piece of porcelain pottery and somebody got it confused with that thing you break at the birthday party in Mexico. Piñata, I think that's called. And they broke that pottery and out of it flowed all of this confetti and candy and stuff. Now see if that doesn't match for you how you would describe this. A porcelain ball. And some kids struck it 
Okay, Brent thinks it's a pork chop. What? Okay, I kind of see that now. Yeah. <laughs> forever. My my image of M43 will forever be changed because now it looks like a pork chop. <laughs> Great. It's jaded now. <laughs> How would you describe this? Now, that's M43. All of this big part down here is M42. So let's back off and get the big picture again. Everything you see down here is M42. And this pork chop is M43. Somebody else tell us what you think it looks like. Boy, look how this blue is shaping up. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that beautiful? Let's put that on about 40% and go look at this blue. So remember, this is, now see if you can test your memory. This is the backlit clusters of, of NGC 1975 and NGC 1977 here that are lighting up. Oh my goodness, look at this red. Look at all that hydrogen right there that's being backlit. You know what, we might be able to make the sky a little bit brighter. Wow. Can you see over YouTube or is that showing up? This is real time, folks. This is not a planetarium program. This is the view through the telescope right now. And look at that hydrogen lighting up inside of this nebula. And then look at all the, I assume that's oxygen uh, that's being backlit there. Whatever it is, dust or whatever, it is beautiful, isn't it? Let's go back out to the big picture now. Isn't that an amazing sight? Okay, so that's 12 minutes. That's plenty. Let's save that exactly as seen. And, boy, I don't know how you could improve on that picture in 12 minutes. Let's stop live stacking. And let's go back over to our planetarium software. I often have to, rather than alt-tabbing to it, I have to... Uh, use the minimize button at whatever's in front. Now, when you said you love the running man, Papa Tech, would you please help me understand which exactly is the running man? Because I, I've i never gotten that straight. Is, is M43 the running man? Help me out there because... Now, did you notice when we were looking at the view through our picture. Let's go look at that picture again, the picture that we saved. And that should be here in desktop sharp cap captures. Oh, we didn't assign a name, did we? So who knows what that called it? <laughs> because we didn't give it a name. So it's just gonna be called capture. Here it is. I found it. We're gonna rename it. We're going to start it with M42 because that's the dominant feature. So this is now the snapshot, the, the picture that we took. Jeff, we are so glad you're here. I'm so glad you were not on call tonight. Um, but I still think it's hilarious that you do this. I mean... If you guys don't know, Jeff is like a vascular surgeon. <laughs> he works like 60 hours a week in the operating room. And then when he's not being a vascular surgeon, he does astronomy on the side. And on the side, he's visiting our live stream. So thanks for being here, Jeff. Uh, so what Papa Tech is telling us is that the red inside of M43 makes a running man. Are you saying that it's that these are his legs and so it's basically upside down? Papatech, because I want to get this. Let's rotate our image a couple of times. And now let's zoom in. Are you saying this is the running man? Wow. Can you see it, guys? These are his legs, right? The running man is three nebulae. 
NGC 1973, 75, and 77. Wow. I guess that must be his ear. And his eyes are right here. And that's his arm. And that's the back of his arm. And these are his legs. Wow. Jeff, that's very kind of you. You are so kind to encourage. You know what? After all of the nights of failure that I've had with this mount, I am just going to bask for a minute that you are encouraging us, brother, because this has not been fun to try to tune up this mount and understand it. So it means the world that you would encourage. Okay, I kind of want to save an image of this. So let's, let's try that right there. And now let's... Can we like, what I'm using here is the, the open source uh, program called, uh, what's it called, EarFan, I think, I-R-F-A-N, is that what it's called? Uh, what we want to do is we want to crop this, right? Crop selection. Yeah. And then we want to save as. And we're going to call this Running Man. And we'll leave everything else the same. So it saved that cropped image without changing our original picture. Oh, you always thought it was what you have now rotated 90 degrees CW. I think Frank is right. Running Man is right way up. If you rotate another CW, rotate, oh, rats. So I didn't have it correct. <laughs> Let's go back and get it again. Running man, it should be, oh, you know what? I bet it saved it in a different frame. I mean, a different folder. I bet my, my save as went to a different folder and I didn't pay any attention. Let's go back here and you guys tell me again. So you think Running Man is what? Because I thought I had it figured out. He is short. I can see it either direction, Papa Tech says. I am not seeing it. But is it this 1975, 1977 business? So let's zoom in again. Let's go over here. Let's keep zooming in. Okay, now there is a bit of a lag, and you're saying in that picture it is 90 degrees counterclockwise. I'm going to go image. Where was my rotate? View. Where was rotate? Rotate counterclockwise. Oh, and those are his arms. Head to the right in that one on my eye. Okay, so let's zoom in again. Let's make this about 66 and go up and then make it 75 and go up. Let's make it 100 and then go up. Like that? Arms spread out wide. How about that? Okay, now let's uh, crop this. So we're going to say, well, first we have to pick it out. So let's go like, what do you think? Just the nebula? So something like that. And then um, what? Edit, crop selection, and then say 
save as. And this time, let's pay attention to what folder we're in. Yeah, that's in pictures. Let's go back to uh, desktop. And most of these are in sharp cap captures. And let's change the title now to Running Man. Okay. I see Papa Tech's Running Man. <laughs> Looks like keep on trucking. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, we'll just minimize that. And we did the observation on 42, didn't we? And 43. Let's check. Uh, show info on 42, 110. Show info on 43. Um, yeah, oh, we didn't. So let's do new observation here. Uh, thankfully, you know, every once in a while it does this. I have to delete that log entry and make a new one for some reason. And I've told, I reported this to the Starry Night Pro folks. Last time I checked, they hadn't responded. Thankfully, um, the guys on the live stream helped me find the running man. First time I've ever observed it both with wide arms and long legs, both alignments. Um, okay, uh, let's go to M43 and, no wait, we already did this. Let's go to M44, that's what we're ready for, right? So now we just say, Slewed M44. I'm going to let us see the big picture uh, here for a second. Oh, look. Our connections failed on our wise cam. Force close up and retry power cycle the camera. Oh my goodness. This is not good. Um, force close up and retry. So that would be like this, right? Oh, we got it back. I can't get it to change. Except I can't get it to change to horizontal again. It's stuck in this vertical mode. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's a good view. Oh, look in the back. There goes an airplane. Uh, while we're here, let's just show you one more time just a quick view of that equipment. Equipment, what would you call it? Plate? Why am I not able to grab that now? It won't let me make it big. Oh, here we go. Oh, my goodness, it slid off the screen. <laughs> you know why that's the case? It's because I have my monitor configured with extended. Anyway, you can see on top there that... Um, equipment plate. And look how I have it cantilevered. Here's the Los Mondi adapter and it attaches to that plate. But that plate is thick aluminum. It's that, it's that Los Mondi equipment plate. Uh, the trick, Jeff, to getting everything running was don't expect to put your own power through the Ioptron Sim 70G mount to power the ports, the power ports on the front of the, the 
saddle. The way the SIM 70G is designed to work, and they don't say a lot of this in the, in the promotional material. It is probably deep in the manual if you look deeply, but when you plug in the regular adapter to run the mount, that plugs in on the left of the base plate of the mount. And then you turn the mount on and it runs the mount. But it also powers the two power ports on the back, the rear of the saddle, where the telescope mounts. So if I'm, I'm going to show you here using the pointer of my mouse, can you see that? Back here on the back of this saddle, those two ports power, there goes another airplane. <laughs> those two ports power um, from the power that runs the mount. And then on the right of the right ascension axis plate, there is a place to plug in another power supply. And presumably if you had like a, what, a Canon something camera that ran on eight volts or something else that ran on some weird voltage, you could use that, um, you could use that power input to run something other than 12 volts. And so they basically don't give you the power supply to plug into that connection point on the back of the right ascension plate. So you can pick your voltage and provide your own power supply. Well, the typical user is going to put like, say, for instance, 12 volts in that, and then use the power ports on the front of the saddle to power up like your cameras, which take 12 volts, right? Well, that's the way I've been trying to do this since September, literally. And over this past weekend, I discovered if you unplug your power from that auxiliary power port provision and you don't use the front saddle power at all, the USB 3 is reliable finally. It's stable. And the mount also doesn't drop on you, which was my problem. I kept having trouble connecting with the mount. As long as you get rid of that power, you know. The other thing I did while I was at it, because I was putting the Pegasus Powerbox Micro on top, I also put the Pegasus Astro USB um, control hub on top, and that let us power those USB ports separately as well. So we didn't have to run those through the mount. And that's more reliable. Instead of running them through the mount and taking them out the back side, they are lots more reliable if you just use your own data cable. Don't run it in the M-mount wiring. So that's what I learned, and man, it's working great. And here are those power, the, the dashboards for the, the Powerbox Micro and the USB control hub. And you can see it gives us really good readouts, 21.6 degrees, relative, community, relative humidity is currently 69%. So it's calculated the dew point for 12.9, and now my I got rid of the old dew buster that I'd had for probably 12 years. <laughs> I, I'm going to sell that on eBay. <laughs> and now the Pocket Powerbox Micro is powering those dew straps. Uh, Jeff says, I'm with you on the DC ports. I ran three separate power bricks to my SIM 70. Oh, yeah, I forgot, Jeff. You've got a SIM 70. One for the mount, one for the ASI through the... That's your your brick computer that, that you have on the tripod and a separate one for the saddle ports. Wow. How about that? So, and the way you solve that also, I'm guessing, is you didn't run your primary camera through the mount, did you? And you don't try to take your primary camera out the back of the right ascension port, do you? Uh, you run it through your computer, that's right. Oh, you have the SIM70 NUC version. I'll have to look that up. I'm not even familiar with that, but I think it's more modern. It's probably like six months newer than the SIM70G that I have. So anyway, let's move this back over. Can I just move that like that? Yeah, let's move that back over there somewhere. ASI Air Plus, that's right. You are in the ASI Air world. But I'm loving this. It's showing us exactly what our voltage is here. You know what else I have coming, and I hope to have this hooked up next time. I'll have a rig runner um, so that I'll have 
a computer view of the input voltage. And then this has given us a computer calibration of the voltage by the time it gets to the last position. And I can tell what the mount and the everything else is sucking up in terms of voltage by looking at the rig runner. And I'll use those Anderson power poles to connect the power to the rig runner and those Anderson power poles again to connect those to the mount. I'm really looking forward to, okay, Jeff, thanks for sending that picture of the setup. Um, I'm really looking forward to having all that set up. I hope to have that done for the next live stream. And I also hope next live stream that I will have switched to fiber to run the all this data. It'll be coming in, Lord willing, by fiber next time. So far, I'm still using the uh, Icron Raven version 3104, which has a limitation of uh, using... Um, cat seven cable and the code here in louisville i don't know where it is how does everyone else but you can't put cat seven in the same conduit as your power and when we lay the observatory conduit under that road we're going to use the existing conduit we have and there's only one there so we have to put the the data line together with the power line and that means we've got to go to fiber rats. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Fiber is actually better because we can go farther and we can also, um, it'll be faster and more throughput, more bandwidth, and we can run with more reliability a networked computer at the observatory once that gets up. The observatory is due to be set up in mid-March. Parts should come end of February. So that's kind of exciting. All right, let's go back to our planetarium software now. And I think... We're looking at our new target here. Our, see how our, our planetarium followed the scope to the new target. And the new target is M44. So I'm going to just zoom in a little bit on M44. And when it does it, I think, yeah, it synchronizes a little bit better. Uh, so M44 is an open cluster. And you know, it's looks like it has about what what is that a, a hundred stars let's let's go here under m44 and look at that for a minute let's read about it you know what let's start our li our live our live stacking that can be live stacking while we do this let's remember to put our name in this time m44 look how we can type in sharp cap over the top of that window isn't that fun m44 is our name and let's since this is just our second, um, you know what I should have done before I did that? Let's cancel this. I should have done our sequencer and gone to the next target because it changes it to three seconds. Now, let's, oh, it went ahead and live stacked while we were doing all that. <laughs> it only had a two-tenths of a degree change. That's actually a nice view, even at <laughs> three seconds. <laughs> this telescope is crazy. <laughs> a, we're getting a plenty nice view of that cluster. My goodness, look at that. It's beautiful. M44, a.k.a. the Beehive Star Cluster, Kim says. Thank you, Kim. So let's, let's look at this description. The famous Beehive Cluster, which we already know because we've got Kim on the live stream. The famous beehive cluster was described by Galileo and has been known since antiquity. It is easily visible to the unaided eye as a faint round patch of luminosity. Let's go over to our 178 for just one second. Oh, before we do that, <laughs> keep our mind on what we're doing here. Let's, we're not going to have to live stack this. You know, we're going to be able to, to look at it as is. We don't need to live stack this. But let's do go over to the 178 right here. Is that, yeah, that's the 178, and that's pretty dark. Uh, you know what? I bet the moon has set. I bet you anything the moon has set. Let's look at our, the moon was scheduled to set. It actually doesn't set. The moon doesn't set until 
it's just lower on the horizon. So it's not as glaring in our image, especially where we're aiming now. Uh, let's look at our mount over here. Look how the mount's pointing off to the east because the view that we have of the mount is like a rifle sight looking up a Polaris. So if it's looking off to the right, that means we're now looking up to the east and the moon is setting over in the west. So that explains why. Um, let's let's zoom in here with our with our 178. And I guess is this our live, is this our beehive cluster, I bet? Maybe. That looks too big to be our BF cluster, doesn't it? Yeah, not quite yet, Frank says. Anyway, it's easily visible to the unaided eye as a faint round patch of luminosity. Maybe there is some luminosity there. And binoculars resembles a swarm of bees, giving rise to this popular name. The cluster contains many double stars. B5 is best seen in binoculars. And in telescopes under low power, the cluster occupies 1.2 degrees of sky and is set against a region of lower star density making it stand out even more. The cluster of several hundred stars may share a common origin with the Hyades cluster. So now let's go back to our 2600 camera. And man, it does look like a swarm of bees. Look at that. Now that we see that description, that's actually a very accurate description, isn't it? Let's, uh, let's zoom into the planetarium view. It doesn't carry as much, does it, with the planetarium view? Partly because you would kind of lose the view of the sky. Hmm. OK, we're going to go back over to the 2600 now. So this is live again. I like this. It does look like. Look, you can see it. You can spot right there. I wonder if that's a real double star. Let's zoom in on that baby. Look at that. You know what? If we zoom in at 100 now, I think you can see that our focus has already changed a little bit. Look at that tiny little donut there. We're going to have to touch up our focus in a second. Just a little bit of atmospheric change. wonder what the temperature is now. Could one degree, because it's changed about one and a half degrees, could one and a half degree have messed up our focus? You guys that are experienced, is one and a half degrees enough to do that? Maybe the scope was still getting used to the colder temperatures, huh? Anyway, backing off, um, there's our swarm of bees. And now we can go here and say add log entry and say, wow. It really does look like a swarm of bees. Now look what else uh, Starry Night Pro lets you do. Watch how I can go over to this and notice how it keeps the observing tool here in front. And I really like that idea because we can observe live and write it down. Uh, we could clearly see the couple of hundred stars and even spotted what we think are some of the doubles. Jeff Horn, he says a degree and a half can. Oh, with the ASI Air, it automatically refocuses when the temperature changes two degrees. Now that's pretty slick. Um, okay, now we don't have to hit save or anything. You just close that observation box. It takes us back to here. One thing I would like to do is I would like to zero in and see if, are we able to see whether or not we are seeing possibly that double star, and I bet you it is. I bet it's this. Huh. Let me get rid of that selection, get that out of our way. OK, 
could be this. That's uh, Tycho 1395 2711. No, that's not said to be a double. That's Hipparchus 42549. That's 1395 2006 1. Nope, none of those are real doubles. Those are all just apparent doubles. Just, in other words, the stars are distances apart, but they appear. It's an apparent double. Okay, it's a nice little open cluster, and uh, you know, I kind of like it. It kind of looks like a swarm of bees. It really does. All right, so that's M44. Let's just do a snapshot of that. So that's saved that, it's saved under the correct name. Let's go back to our, we don't have to, um, let's do set our um, sequencer on the faster next target sequence. And then let's go, oh, maybe it still was. Let's go back to planetarium. Sometimes you have to minimize the window in front of the planetarium. And let's go to M45. Um, slew to M45. Now let's try to think. Oh, M45 is Pleiades, isn't it? So we won't spend a real long time on this. It's such a popular target. Now that's the view at the planetarium program. And over here to the right, you can see the scope changing views. But let's also go over to the 178. Because it's kind of fun to watch the 178 move with the sky. And you can see the star trails, see? as we're spinning across the sky. And that thing there that you see, that's likely the moon, isn't it? Yeah, see that's the moon getting low on the horizon, I bet. Now let's zoom in a little bit. That actually is zoomed in. We don't have much zoom power with this uh, because it's just a camera lens looking at a wide-angle view of the sky. So there's not a telescope here. But look at that moon down there. Isn't that cool? Let's look at that just briefly in our minimize the window in front of Starry Night Pro. Now there is the the perfect framing it thinks that we have. Now, I don't know if we really have that because maybe our our um, field of view is not aligned. Let's get, well, of course, that'll change at different points in the sky depending on whether we're peer east or peer west, won't it? So let's don't pay any attention to that. Let's go over to sharp cap. And wow, so what are we looking at here? Wow. <laughs> Let's change the name to M45 first. And since we slewed across a lot of the sky, let's go ahead and do the plate solve to make sure we're looking at exactly the right view. Oh, I think I see it. I think it was already spot on. Uh, 0.2 degrees. It was two tenths off. You see, that's the handle up there. So we're basically, right now, the scope at the point where we are. And you can look over and see the orientation here. That's pretty much straight up and down, isn't it? That's not, from our vantage point, it doesn't look like it's leaning over much on the pier, does it? I think that's an optical illusion. I think it has to be leaning over some. Yeah, we just don't have a good vantage point. I think we're pure something. Are those the counterweights there? So I can't see. Let's leave it there and we'll go back and look at it in a second. Anyway, I think the handle of this little Pleiades deal is up toward the top. 
So now that we're um, set, let's change our uh, sequence to 20 seconds to pick up some of that nebulosity. And let's clear the livestock. Is that the Ioptron Trippier? Trippier? Is that French? Trippier? Tripier. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the I it's the uh, Ioptron Tripier. <laughs> I kept thinking, is he saying French? Is that what that is? Um quite a bit of noise on that first shot, isn't it? I wonder let's Let's move our black level to the right a little and get rid of some of that grain in the sky. Now let's let our livestock do its work. That's actually not bad of that nebulosity, is it? After 60 seconds. <laughs> you know, guys, I am just fascinated by the Rasa. That's 60 seconds, and look how much nebulosity we already have. You know, I saw recently on Cloudy Night, somebody started a thread called, if you could have the, the rig of your dreams for your life, what, what would it be? And I felt so embarrassed because what I have would be the rig of my dreams. This is amazing to think that you can bring in this much uh of that nebulosity after now we're at a hundred seconds so a minute and a half wow and look how this one is starting to pick up let's zoom in on that a little bit wow very little stretching i mean this is the real deal that we're really seeing here I'm amazed. I mean, if you look at this through binoculars, you're going to see this beautiful, beautiful um, cluster. But that nebulosity, if I remember right, that does require minimize the window in front of. Let's read the um, info. Pleiades is the most famous of all open star clusters. Let's put that right there and let's go back to the live view of it. So this is a live view. And let's make it a little bit bigger just, oops, just by getting that out of the way. Containing 500 members, around 500 members set against a black velvet sky. This young first magnitude open cluster is easily visible to the unaided eye and resembles a smaller version of the Big Dipper. So you can see the handle here, and then there's the cup. Uh, at least six hot blue stars are readily visible, and keen eye observers can see more. So keen eye observers might see this one out front. You know, we need to learn the names of all these. Kim, that's very kind of you to say. You know. Privately, Kim, I'm just amazed that our mount is working. <laughs> um, because of its large diameter, two degrees, M45 is best seen in binoculars or a rasa. Uh, a faint veil of nebulosity surrounds the brightest Pleiades members with the most easily observable patch being the Merope Nebula, IC349. So that must be this. So let's slide over again to our planetarium software. Slide over again to our planetarium software. Merope, that is that one. Let's learn the name of all these stars, guys. The mount always holds it together. <laughs> yeah, Jeff is right. Don't jinx it, Jeff says. <laughs> you know, the truth is, Jeff, now that I'm not running that power, I have such confidence in it. But you're right, we shouldn't jinx it. This one's called what? Atlas? 
Let's zoom in a little bit here so we can read those easier. Atlas. That one doesn't seem to have a name. This one is Merope. This is Electra. Sele Seleno. C E L A E N O. Tigeta, Maya, and Sterope. So this is Merope and Sterope. So name stars have got. Oh, and this one's Pleon. So name stars at the level that we have the name showing up. You know, you can adjust that here in. Where is that? Options. Stars, stars, labels. Let's put it right here for a second and say, nope, I don't think there is a label for that one called VDB23. Anyway, um, as you can see, StarNet Pro lets you adjust the number of star labels that you see. Um, so let's memorize these. Pleon, Atlas, Merope. So let's go back over to SharpCap. Pleon, no. Pleon, Atlas, Merope. And this one doesn't get a name. Why minimize the thing in front of SharpCap? Why didn't that get a name? Let's zoom in on that a little bit more. Ah, Al Sion. It was just so tiny we weren't seeing it. Al Sion. Seven sisters, strange names. Yep. Al Sion. So Pleon, Atlas, Al Sion. Merope, Electra, Seleno. Taigata, Maya, Sterope. You guys got those all memorized? Uh, these reflection nebulae are not remnants of glass clouds where the Pleiades was born, but a chance cloud of dust that the cluster is passing through. In some ancient cultures, ceremonies to honor the dead were held on the day when the Pleiades reached its highest point in the sky at midnight. This is around Halloween. Ancient Aztecs believed the Pleiades would be overhead at midnight, the day the world ended. Wow, that's like terrifying. Okay, for our picture, let's just uh, hope we got to bring our livestock back up. Where'd our livestock go? We got to go back over here and get it. And let's pin it again. And save. Exactly as seen. Let's see what happens if we push that a little bit more. Gets a lot brighter. You know, sometime I'm going to work on the centering of my uh, Rasa. What would you call that? Your field? Because I pick up a lot more. When I push, when I push this mid-level, when I push that, it begins picking up a lot more, what would you call that, diffusion? So I think what that means is, I gotta go to that Octopi Astro, thank you Keith, the amazing people at Octopi Astro lets us adjust every single axis on this Rasa 11, every single X, Y, Z, Whatever you want to adjust, you can adjust it. And I need to bring the center. I need to bring the camera a little bit more in the center of the field of view to get rid of that diffusion there. That's what it is. So I'm kind of like the guy in The Wizard of Oz. Oh, Frank says flats will correct that out. I'm like the guy in The Wizard of Oz, and I'm saying, don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. I'm saying, don't pay any attention to that diffusion over there to the left. I have flats, but I haven't shot them lately. I haven't shot in them. Listen to that poor grammar. I haven't shot them lately. <laughs> Let's do a um, 
observation here, new observation. This view of M45 was crazy fun. Lots of stellar dust and clouds. Amazing. We started seeing it on the first subframe at, what are we now, nine minutes? It was crazy good. We need to learn the names of these stars. Okay, so close that. One more time. Pleon Atlas are the two doubles up there by the handle. They're not literal doubles. Oh, look. Does that mean they are? No. CED19P and CED19O. That doesn't mean they're doubles, does it? No. Um, this one was Alcyone, and then Mirope, Electra, Seleno, Taigata, Maya, Sterope. Yeah, another day. I need to shoot flat sprint. Oh, flats would darken the center, not the edges, I think. I think also when I did my uh, CCD inspector report, it was out of the center anyway. So even if flats would correct it, I need to bring it back in the center. I was just in a hurry to go image that night, and I was so thrilled just to be in a place where I finally could image. I need to tune that so it's more in the center. It shouldn't take that long to adjust that centering. What takes a long time is moving the, moving the camera in and out with a mirror to try to find the right back focus, whatever you call that, and all that stuff. That's terrifying. All right, so we did M45. Let's go to M46. Anybody remember what M46 is? You know what? I think it's, I think it's, I think I've been working on learning M46. Whoops, I need to stop this livestock. <laughs> uh, sequencer, go to the four second, three second view. Um, change this to M46. I tell you where we were working on learning M46. We were Working on it the night, Frank, remember when we did that contest together? Uh, that little game, quiz show. Ah, uh, yeah, M46 is this cluster. Oh, this is a beautiful little cluster. And this has that planetary nebula in it, NGC 2438. This is a fun cluster. Look how it looks like a snowball of Christmas lights. Okay, let's go back over to the scope for a second. And then let's go back over to, oh my goodness, look at the moonlight. Oh my goodness, we'll be lucky if we can even see this cluster. The moonlight is killer. Uh, let's go back to sharp cap and let's, we don't need to play solve that, do we? But you know what I think we should do, gang? Look how that's just a little bit out of focus. Would you forgive me if we go focus really quickly? Because that is just a little bit out of focus. That means we close sharp cap, we open up Nina. Never use a sequencer. What steps are you going through with it? Uh, yeah, that was fun. Now I forget which part you're talking about, Frank. Jeff says, do it. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so we're going to load the profile. We're going to load the camera. We're going to load the focuser. We're going to go to imaging. 
and we're going to start the autofocus routine. Um, Brent, you ask about the steps on the sequencer. Let's go over to sharp cap. Oh, we closed it. Never mind. <laughs> um, on the sequencer, we have it saying, for instance, on the routine that we call next target. First thing we do is we back the exposure to a fast exposure of three seconds. So there are three second snapshots, three second time exposures. We pump up the gain to something like 300. So we get a real bright view of everything. Uh, then the next step we do is we make sure it does turn off live stacking, by the way, if it's not off. And I think that's it. Um, that lets us see the sky so we can do the plate solve well. Then the second sequence we do is called next target. And when we start next target, we change the exposure to 20 seconds. We change the gain to 100. We um, start live stacking. No, first we, uh, we reset the side display histogram. We reset that, but we don't stretch it. We just reset it. We start live stacking. We reset the live stacking big histogram. Um, but you know what? I might have taken that out because I noticed on nights where I was doing a lot of targets, I didn't need to reset the histogram as much. And I, wanted, I, I stopped wanting it to mess with our stretch. And oftentimes the stretch can just stay the same. Another thing I used to do on it, I used to do an auto color balance, you know, reset the color balance, the, the white balance, and then auto set the white balance, the color balance. But I think I stopped that too. So it's just simply start the live stack, clear the live stack, and then it turns control back to you. So they're not complicated. But they do save a little bit of that routine of going one by one and clicking in that side panel to do that. The trivia game, right, Frank? Okay, so we should play that trivia game. You guys, you guys we should play that while this is auto-focusing. Um, <laughs> it's pretty nutty, isn't it, Frank? Do we dare? We have more participants tonight. Let's see. Um, see if I can log on. Sometimes it doesn't log me in correctly. I don't understand this part. If I go up here and let's go back to that link again, right here. If I go up here and manually grab my password and then put, I think is my, is that what we do? Yeah. Okay, so let's start with um, <clears throat> level one. And let's see. How do we do this, Frank? Do you remember? We go, is it start? And then is it classic mode? Okay, so you guys need to go to Kahoot. Can you hear that music? The prize is slightly used Sim 70. <laughs> you know, last, uh, what was that, last Thursday night? I would have done it. You know I would have done it, Frank. <laughs> um, 
I am. I'm using Jeff the Celestron light pollution filter. Okay, so it's waiting for the players. What you do is you go to kahoot.it, kind of like pretend it's Italy. K A H O O T dot IT. So go there right now, please. You just open up a browser and put in kahoot.it and then you put in this pin. Can you hear me over that music? Roger that, Jeff says. Are you guys able to hear me over this music or is that music coming through at all? I don't think you're hearing the music. Maybe you're hearing it just slightly mic'd. Uh, 8202536. Now, shouldn't we be able to see players here? I'm only seeing one player. You know, I should do it on my phone. No music here. I should do it on my phone with you guys because what's fair is fair. Uh, Kahoot.it go game pin 8202536. Uh, enter. Nickname Okay, so we've got EHS4, HornJS, Chewy, and Papa Tech who are willing to go and play. You guys realize Boy, how do I get this live stream out of my way? I'm gonna I think I'm gonna log out of the live stream on my phone here because this is just in my way. Um, okay, are we ready? Just the four of us are going to play. Okay, so start. Type the answer. What is the Messier number of this planetary nebula? Okay, so the handicap I have is I have to type it on my phone. Oh, I put in the wrong answer. I didn't even look at the target first. <laughs> this is good because you guys are going to get the fair shake here. Three answers. One more player we're waiting on. Okay, time's up. What does that mean? Did nobody get it? Oh, I'm so sad. Wow, but that redeems me because I was in a hurry. I didn't even look at the screen. <laughs> okay, so I got a chance. Now I'm competing with you guys. Oh, this is good because... Seventeen. You know, this is really good because none of us got that again. <laughs> We're killing this. <laughs> let's try it again, guys. <laughs> now let's double down here. Be a little more serious. Not so fast. Oh, we got this one, huh? Everybody's going to get this one. Speed matters on this. Can you guys not hear that? I think because you're listening to the live stream, you're not hearing it, but it's playing the coolest music in the background. I can go see if I can get the music for you on the live stream, but, but that might be weird. Okay. 
Emerald Hill Skies 4 has got 924. Pressure's on, guys. <laughs> You better get this. <laughs> All right. That's what we got to see. That's what we like. What is the Messier number of this interacting grand design? I think we got a couple of winners. Okay, ready? Mm. Uh -huh. We got a couple of winners. Actually, we have three. Somebody actually typed out the words Eagle Nebula. <laughs> well done. Woohoo! Okay, here we go. Oh. oh. We got some winners. Somebody typed out Andromeda Galaxy <laughs> one letter at a time. Well done. <laughs> uh, you did have to look first. Ah, two winners. Loving it. You know, if you guys can't hear that music, then I'm going to feel really ridiculous. Because I am grooving here. <laughs> Uh, we got a couple winners again. This is next to last. Oh, this is a giveaway. This is like the free square on the bingo board. We image this tonight. Every one of us ought to get this. Look at that nebulosity. That looks like our Rasa picture, doesn't it? <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Go, Rasa. Somebody mistyped the answer, I think. Last question. While this is um, finishing, we got our autofocus, so I'm going to, um, well, I wasn't fast enough, was I? <laughs> 
Okay. I should not have been able to participate because I actually designed the game. <laughs> so I cheated. <laughs> I designed the game. <laughs> so I don't count. So Jeff won and Papa Tech comes in second because employees of whatever shouldn't have been able to play. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's a fun game, isn't it? Okay, so much for that. Let's leave. That's fun, isn't it? Okay, so we did get our out of focus. So let's disconnect the focuser. Let's disconnect the camera. Let's leave the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria. And let's open up Sharp Cap again. And I'm going to go back into the live stream. There we go. Lots of fun, Doug, Jeff says. Papa Tech says, funny. I said ring, and it said wrong. I think it needed another number. <laughs> no music. Rats. That's so sad. I'm going to look really ridiculous on that live stream. Okay. Um, connect the camera. And sequencer, just to show this real quick. Down here is all there is to it. Um, you can see what happens in the sequence here. And this is the one, let me make sure. Next target. Let's. Uh, let's do uh, see next target first. Yeah. So next target says live stacking stop set exposure to three set gain to 400. It's kind of simple, isn't it? It's really super simple. And then start imaging says set the gain to 100 set exposure to 20 live stacking start delay to then it resets the live stack. So that's all there is to it. Very simple. And if you want, you can uh, Replay the video. Okay, let's uh, name this. And it's M46, isn't it? And we don't have to plate solve, but let's plate solve more so, so that we can add this to our model. Because every time we plate solve, you guys know this who are amateur astronomers, but for somebody watching this later and you're learning astronomy, every time you plate solve, it it inserts another computer model into the mount and makes it more accurate. So we had a 21 one hundredths error in our picture. And by plate solving, we improve our model of the night sky. So the the mount is so much better at aiming the telescope at everything. So I like to do it pretty often, especially when we slewed to another spot. Now let's do in the sequencer the one called start image. And as soon as it says finished, then we can close that sequencer. And it says finished. And it cleared the live stock for us. So it's catching the first frame. While that's catching now, let's go back over to, gee, I shouldn't say catching. Sounds like I'm talking about COVID. Let's go back over to our planetarium software and read about M46. Show info. I am glad that little heater came on because I'm going to sneak down and raise it a degree because it's, I tell you, it waited a long time before it kicked on, and I'm chilly in here. The furnace is out on this side of the building. Uh, anyway, it says M46 is a large and rich open cluster that contains over 500 stars. It makes a lovely side of binoculars as two other open clusters, M47 and NGC2423, are visible in the same field of view. Rats, I wonder if we caught those by sheer accident. 
M47 and NGC 2423. I don't see them. Let's back out a little. Oh, we missed it. There's M47. I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go over here and look. Yeah. Oh, well, let's just look at this since we've got several seconds on it. I think this is going to be enough. Look at the number of stars. Oh, see what this says. Of special interest, the planetary nebula seems to be embedded near the cluster's center. We'll see that. Although the planetary nebula is probably not actually part of the cluster, it simply lies along the same line of sight. It makes for a good opportunity to see two different types of deep sky objects at the same time. That is amazing, isn't it? Let's uh, move our black level a little bit. See, we're not getting that diffusion yet, so we're safe so far. We move this until we start getting that weird diffusion on the left side of our screen. And then we crunch this in a little bit. That'll help us see a lot of that planetary nebula. You know what I think we're going to enjoy looking at NGC 2423? Is how we can see the center star of it. And I don't think that the center star is that bright one. I hope you can see this. You'll have to really get your you have to get your eye really close to the image here. Um, the the center star is the very 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 faint one. I'm going to violate the um, rule that says don't make your uh, zoom any farther than your. I'm going to violate that for a second, just to show you what I mean. You know, in other words, I'm zooming farther now than my camera's resolution can support. But I'm doing it to show you. This bright star, I don't think that's the center star. I think this thing behind the center star. So now as I back off that, there's 300%. Follow that little faint thing there. I think that's the center star of the planetary. Now, you guys who are amateur astronomers know this, but let's, let's say it for those who are who are maybe listening in that are new. Um, a planetary nebula, I understand, is basically a star that's beginning to age. It's kind of like an elderly star. And at some point in its life, for whatever reason that maybe astrophysicists argue about so far, uh, this aging star jettisons a large part of its outer material as if it's breathing some sigh of its last breath. But it's not dead yet. It's just <gasps> like you would on a deathbed, maybe, or like you would if you were aging. You go, oh, when you get up to the top of the stairs, it breathes out that material. And it's traveling out at something like some reasonable speed. It's not light speed. It's traveling out at some reasonable speed, like maybe, I don't know, let's say, I don't know, just to give you an idea, let's say something like the speed of sound, for instance. It's traveling more slowly because it's just like firing a flare up in the air, like a shell of a firework on July 4th. It fires that material out in the sky and yet it becomes still a star in the middle. It still is a star in the middle. And that's that center dim star that we see right in there. Uh, then this outer material can take various forms. And when we zoom in on it in a live stack, it lets us see sometimes some color. And I don't know if you can tell, along the fringe, we're already starting to see that color. At just five minutes, we can start to see that color and in this case, that color is like an orangish reddish so far. Um, 
what will happen someday is that that star in the middle will probably completely explode and become a supernova or else it'll just die and all that will be left is this expanding shell at that point. Uh, but planetary nebula have nothing to do with a planet. It was a, a name in astronomy that stuck because the first astronomers looked and they thought they had discovered another planet. See how that kind of looks like a, it looks like a, it's a sphere, like another, another Saturn or another Jupiter, Saturn without the rings. So they thought it was a planet, but it's not. So now we call it planetary nebula um, as kind of a throwback of what they saw. Now let's also zoom back and look at the big picture of all of this field, the rich field of stars. And I tell you what, we could use some computer, couldn't we, to count all these. As astro astrometry? Astrometry would probably count these stars for us. But how many would you estimate there? I mean, are there are there 2,000? It's beautiful, isn't it? Let's do a quick observation here. This is M46, isn't it? Uh, we zoomed way in on the planetary nebula. Planetary nebula and could make out what we thought or think is the um, uh, center star started to see some color around the fringe of the jettisoned material. You know what we ought to do? Let's save this and let's say, wow, rich star field. And then let's go to this um, NGC 2423. So I'll go up here and I'll say NGC 2423. And that's a quick way to get to it and do a um, new observation there. And I'll paste that in. Whoops. Does this sometimes. <laughs> you have to delete the one you created. And I've turned it into Simcur, <laughs> people at simulation curriculum. And they haven't answered me yet. Okay, so there's that observation. Now let's get our Messier list back. And it's 1253. So we're on our last group. Papa Tech. Ben Fun, almost 1 a.m. here. Thanks for the live views and the great conversation. Good night. Papa Tech, thanks so much for joining us. So many stars, he said. Uh, we have like seven minutes. Is there any request from the group? Anything you guys want to see that we haven't gone and looked at yet? I'll give you a second to answer since there's a delay between the live and the and the comments. Um, we could just go on to M47. I don't remember what that is. M47. I don't think we've started learning that one yet. Let's show info. It's a nice open cluster. M78 is near Orion. Wonder what the Rasa can pull in. Okay, so let's go to M78 and then is that NGC 2244? Let's do both of those. So first, real quick, NG M78 slew there. And you see the telescope has lost connection again, the scope view. Oh boy. But you can see the planetarium program is tracking us. And then over in the The 178 sky view, there you got all those blurred stars. I think we're going to kill this again. 
and then reopen it. You know what we'll do when we do the observatory? We'll put a router out at the observatory and we'll connect it so that it's on the same router as the office here. And maybe we won't have these dropouts with our WISE 3 Skycam. Because that is bothersome. Okay, so 178 is showing us Orion, and you can see there is still some competition with the moon. Uh, let's go back over to Sharp Cap. Oops, <laughs> we didn't stop the livestock. Can I still save this? Does anybody remember? Does it let me? <laughs> it probably just didn't stack those last frames, right? Now let's um, in our sequencer go to next target real quick. And now let's change the name to M78 sync just to build our to keep building our um, computer model inside the mount tonight once we get uh, the observatory I don't think we'll have to plate solve nearly as often this found a uh, 0.2 degrees uh, error I don't think we'll have to plate solve as often because we'll make this model you see and then we'll keep that model and we'll stop this plate solving and we'll like maybe once every month we'll okay so we're we're ready to go to our next let's see start imaging now we finish the sequence and now let's while that's live stacking, let's go over to minimize the frame in front of us. M78. So this is Located above Orion's belt. M78 belongs to the same large cloud of gas and dust as the main Orion Nebula, M42. It has two companion nebulae, NGC 2067 and 2071. All three are reflection nebulae, and M78 is in fact the brightest reflection nebula. It is visible in binoculars, but best seen through a telescope. Notice the fan-like wisp of M78 along with two prominent 10th magnitude stars that lie at the center of this nebula. Boy, you can already see the prominent stars. And we're seeing the fan-like wisp. That's not a bad... Let's make the sky a little bit darker and back off this for a moment just to help that sky... be jet black. So does this nebula have any abbreviations? Any um, nicknames? Let's look at our sky view. See, our moonlight is hurting us just a little bit, isn't it? I mean, stop and think. That moonlight is competing for our view. You're very kind to say that, Jeff. Um, I am enjoying it for sure now that we have a working mount. <laughs> I, for example, Jeff, I don't know if you saw the last live stream I did. I was here from 9 p.m. until 3 a.m. And we didn't image one thing except Polaris. I finally 
disconnected the mount from sharp cap and it let us see Polaris through the Rasa. Because honestly, I couldn't make the mount do anything. So imagine with me what a joy it is to have tonight compared to last time. And again, it's just really the, the difference of not running power through the right axis plate is all the difference in the world. So let's see, let's, again, keeping that black, black. Shall we lower the blues or lower the greens one more step? I don't know what this is supposed to look like. What is, what does M78 normally look like? Let's go out here and say M78 images and get some of the ones that are quite Yeah, I don't know that I've ever, it says I looked at it last year on January 29th. And on that night I said, difficult, but could see not only the main nebula, but also the bank of star cloud nearby. But you know, that's code name for, I'm not very good at this yet. <laughs> that's what that is. I don't remember this. Do we have a nickname for this? M78 wiki. No. There's no nickname. We should name it tonight, guys. Let's name it. Let's do it. Okay. Type in your name. This is your chance to become famous. What name are you going to give this? Wonder if I have my colors right. Let's do a color balance from scratch. See, that's too many blues. And that's too many greens. That's the Celestron light pollution filter. Yeah, that's just not as good, period, is it? Let's try this color balance again. Boy, look at it, try to figure out with the moon there. Really, our first color balance was best. On a, what was it, 60 some percent moonlit night? So this is the planetarium program. Planetarium program shows a little bit more of a salmon color to the dust. So let's do bring the reds up. Man, maybe we're pushing that too much. That's probably what it is. We're pu pushing the mids too much. Look at how we're starting to see nebulosity out here. I can't believe you guys are still up. It's 104 and there are 10 of you still watching. This is crazy. Try moving your black level to the left of the main peak in the histogram. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're right, Kim, but that definitely doesn't give us a black sky, does it? But it does show more nebulosity in that cloud. 
Look at this, the way you can see these clouds better now. I like that. That's seven minutes. Let's save it there. This is the best. Um, let's save it there and let's go to what you said. Was it NGC 2244? What is that? Oh, wait. Let's write here a new observation. Um, you know, if I'll just hover over to the left, much clearer this year. Patchy, cloudy, splotches, something like that. Um, NGC 2244. Before we slew there, let's go stop our livestock and put our sequencer on next target. And let's read about this. The Rosette Nebula. Of course. Okay. Let's go over to here. Looks like it already found it. That didn't have to move very much, did it? And then here we'll close this. Plate solve that. Just again, we're trying to improve our model inside the computer, inside the mount. I would show you a live view, but unfortunately, our Wise 3 camera has died on the vine. Okay, 0 0.01 degrees. Now our model's pretty good, and we didn't move very far. One one hundredth of a degree of correction. And it's already made that, so now we're ready to say start imaging. And we're going to go seven minutes on this and then close the live stream because you guys have been up too long. You need to get some sleep. You guys make it a lot more fun. Thanks for being here. You know, this is a night of celebration. Um, oh, my goodness. Let's bring this back down to there. Did that not clear? I'm going to clear that just in case. I must have clicked on the wrong, or it didn't have time to finish. That's not the Rosette Nebula, is it? Oh, we've slewed M78 again. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, we, we didn't slew yet. We just... Minimize the windows in front. Slew to NGC 2244. Now let's go watch the movement. Tonight's a night of celebration. Sim 70 for the win. <laughs> I don't know what that stands for. Um, I do take back what I was saying. Hey, look at the ice crystals forming on the front of the dew shield reflecting in the moonlight. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Minimize the window in front of Starry Night Pro because it doesn't play well with Alt-Tab. Um, zoom in. And notice how as we zoom in, what is a good framing? As we zoom in, um, Starry Night Pro corrects its field of view symbol and makes it match. 
Okay, here we go. This is now NGC 2244. And we're already at 20 seconds. So now let's start live stacking. Start live stacking and clear the live stack. <laughs> Jeff, I really appreciate your efforts to allow us to watch real-time astronomy when our sky sucks. So, Jeff, you got clouds. Um, <laughs> that's sad. You know, it is a, it's just a stellar clear night, no pun intended. It is incredibly clear. Oh, my goodness, that was 20 seconds. The first frame. You can already see. see Doug speechless. <laughs> that, is so, that is so fun. Thank you, Lord, for making this beautiful object, but thank you for giving us an instrument to look at it. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. All month long. That's so sad, Jeff. There's a satellite jumping into our frame without permission. Boy, I tell you what, this is amazing. Eighty seconds. Okay, let's go. Um, Minimize the frame in front of sharp cap because it doesn't play well with alt tab. We're going to say show info and look at the description. So it's an emission nebula, open cluster in the constellation Monoceros, 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 located 5,000 light years away from the sun. That's from our sun, so it's 5,000 light years away. This open cluster is one of the finest in the sky, but the nebulosity involved in it is harder to see, requiring dark skies, which we don't have tonight. We have a 60% moon, and a narrow band nebula filter. We do have a light pollution filter, which, you know, masquerades as a nebula filter sometimes. Portions of this large object have been given individual NGC numbers like 2237, 2238, 2239, and 2246. Rosa, probably my favorite right now. Just imaged this Saturday in minus 16 centigrade. Whew. That's cold. So this is, um, interestingly, you guys will like this. Let me show you what this is. In Starry Night Pro, I'm going to say... Um, In Star Night Pro, this is the way it came. Ready? That's the way it came. They show you the Rosette Dark Nebula Complex names, but they don't give you an image of Rosette Nebula. And I don't know why. So I took one. And with Star Night Pro, you can actually paste your own picture into your planetarium software. And then forevermore, your picture is there. It's there in the night sky, you know. And by the way, if you had noticed, this is our real horizon. And this is the building I'm in. And I'm in that office right there in the corner. And I have this as the... the photorealistic landscape in Starry Night Pro. And that nebula is a user image that we can click on and off. If Starry Night Pro were to give us one, we could click on theirs and click ours off. But they didn't. Now, isn't that fun? So that is a Rasa image right there that you're looking at. And then when you come over to this, you are watching a, a Rasa image form. It is neat that it can do that, Curtis. You're right. 
let's bump this mid up a little bit to see if some of those will pop. Pay no attention to the diffusion on the side. I tell you what. So fun. Let's go deep in and just study some of these dust lanes for a minute. Boy, I'm glad we focused a while ago. <laughs> this is really pretty tight focus now. We're at 100%. Look at all those dust lanes. That's like soot. I mean, it's not the same as the the dust under our beds. It's more like the 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 dust if you took a candle and held it under a piece of glass for a minute. It's the soot that forms on the glass. And it's blocking our view of that hydrogen. Did they add JWST to Starry Night Pro? They did it to Sky Safari Pro finally. Yes, but people have been telling me, and I haven't checked it, in Sky Safari Pro, people have been telling me it's not accurate. Bach globulars, block, Bach globules are awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the scientific name for that, isn't it? Bach globules. You know, I could just pan through this image forever. There's just so much to look at here. But I know it's 117, <laughs> this live stream. But I'm so thrilled to have a working mount. You won't hear me complain. I tell you what we'll do. Um, as soon as I finish this live stream, I'll do another live stream of trying to go and find the JWST. Small dark nebulae. Nice. Uh, but I'm gonna I think I'm gonna make that a separate live stream because we have been going a long time and I don't want to like abuse your guys's hospitality uh, But there you go. It's a lot of fun Doug kudos to your tilt correction your star really looks good Oh my goodness. That's so nice of you to say yeah, but I got to get that centering that'll get rid of this diffusion over here Once I center this and I'm gonna leave the tilt alone Once I center it that'll get rid of that diffusion. I was just in a hurry and I wanted to start I want to start um, seeing some stuff. So I'm going to back off just a hair and I'm going to make that sky a little bit darker so that we get rid. There we go. We got rid of that diffusion now. Let me see if I add this back, if we can bring back some of that brightness. This is just seven minutes. And boy, look how bright red these are becoming. Save this exactly as seen. JPL Horizon is a good site to find JWST if you can use it. Yeah, I did a video on that, uh, Curtis. In fact, you can search. If you search for um, what? Starry Night Pro. I forget what. Oh, Poison Arrow Frog. Thank you for being a part of this. Uh, you could search Emerald Hill Skies and go look. I did a video on... Uh, using JPL Horizons to go find it. So I'm going to stop uh, the, the main live stream. I'm going to go find it in a separate live stream just so that that'll be a smaller live stream to go do that. Guys, thanks a lot for being part of this. Once again, if you watch this whole thing tonight like Poison Arrow Frog 001 did, uh, please do hit subscribe if you don't mind. It doesn't cost you anything and it does help the channel to get out in the, in the algorithms of everybody else's uh, set. Uh, you could hit uh, uh, the bell to be notified if you wanted of when we do these live streams. And if you don't mind, I hate asking, but if, again, it doesn't cost you anything. If you could do a thumbs up, it does help the video get out in other people's um, sets. So thanks for being a part of this, to do this um, live stream with us. And I just want to say one more time what a joy it is to have come back to this and gotten a working mount. Uh, thank you for the patience you showed us. If you looked at our last video, it was like 20 minutes of frustration because I couldn't get the mount to work. And I know you've heard me say it as to how we fixed it, so I'm not going to go back in it again. 
but thank you for being a party here for the celebration cruise uh, to christen it again working and uh, we're gonna stop the live stream but thanks again for being a part of this I can't go home yet it's still fun thank you guys get some good sleep and thanks for being a part of this thank you Brent thank you Jeff thank you Kim from Australia for being a part of this good night and thanks to God for making beautiful objects like this for us to see